Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies to set your heart on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us on this 24th Sunday of Ordinary Time. You know, in life, there are some things that just seem to go together. Peanut butter and jelly, salt and pepper, Romeo and Juliet, the New York Giants, and losing, right? Some things were just meant to be together. But since the mid-1500s, there's been considerable debate about two more things that should always go together, faith and works. So really, how are we saved? By our faith in Jesus Christ or by our good deeds in following the Ten Commandments? And the answer is yes. But the history is a lot more complicated than that. So on one side, there's a teaching that many of the early Protestants believed, a teaching called sola fide, which really, really means being saved by faith alone. In fact, Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, once wrote to a spiritual friend and he said, quote, God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. Be a sinner, sin boldly, but let your trust in Christ be stronger and rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. We will commit sins while we are here, for this life is not a place where justice resides. No sin can separate us from him, though, even if we were to kill or commit adultery thousands of times each day. Now, I don't think that Luther was actually telling people to go out and sin and not worry about it as if it's no big deal. But his belief was that all we needed to do for heaven was just simply to believe what Jesus did, regardless of what we do or don't do. But on the other side, there's an equally dangerous extreme. And the early church wrestled with a heresy called Pelagianism. So Pelagius was a heretic who denied original sin. And he said that we don't need God's grace. We could just freely choose to be perfect just by our own efforts. You know, if we just try hard enough, we can live a good life. And so we don't necessarily need Jesus to save us. I mean, he kind of gave us the example, but that's basically it, right? And, you know, we could be holy just by imitating him, even without like needing actually his grace. And, you know, sometimes I see that error still a lot around today. Like, for example, at funerals, when people say, oh, you know, I know that Uncle Billy didn't really believe or go to Mass or pray, but he was very nice, so I know he's in heaven, right? Well, that's Pelagianism, right? Believing that just being nice is good enough to get to heaven. And that's not a good thing to be a heretic like that. But both of these are opposite errors, right? The truth, as Aquinas says, is usually the midpoint between two extremes, And so I think St. James puts it best when he says that what saves us is living faith. You know, we're saved by our faith in Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection and not in anything we've done, but that faith remains dead until it is vivified by good works. It's good works that puts that faith into action. Consider the example of the first person ever to enter into heaven. Who was it? Do you know? Was it Mary, the apostles, one of the great saints. No, it wasn't. According to scripture, the first person to enter heaven was the good thief, right? It was the good thief who was crucified alongside Jesus. And he turns to Christ and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom, to which Jesus responds, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He had no good works, no good deeds to bring to Jesus. He was a thief, a public sinner, right? But by his faith, he was saved. But What if he was brought down alive and allowed to continue his life? Do you think he'd say, well, now that I confess Jesus as Lord, now I can go back to being a thief? Well, I don't think that would be saving faith at all, right? Of course not. Saving faith means that we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, and then we live like Jesus is Lord. You know, we see the same dynamic in today's gospel. St. Peter has rock-solid faith. He's the first person to recognize Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. What faith he has. But then, when Jesus reveals to him the reality that Christian life involves the cross and the living out of the faith, eh, that becomes kind of a stumbling block to Peter, right? And a lot of Christians have that same challenge. I mean, it's easy enough to believe in Jesus in our heads, but when it comes to actually living it out, it's another matter because it involves the cross. You know, I'm reminded of a a Peanuts cartoon where Linus says, I love mankind. It's this people I can't stand. Right? Because it's a nice notion to think, for example, that Jesus is the center of our life. But it's a little tougher when we got to actually have that conversation with our kid's sports coach that we got to miss a game to get to Mass. It's good theology to believe that everyone's made in the image and likeness of God, but that gets tough to put that theology into practice when we have to sit next to our brother in law at Thanksgiving, you know, the one without social graces, and he's very rude and argues about politics, right? Faith plus works 
equals the cross. But don't be afraid, though, because it's through the cross that we draw close to Jesus and become like him. I want to close with the story of a saint who combines the beautiful gift of piety and deep faith in Christ with the active participation in good works, St. Louise de Merillac. Now, she was born and raised among the French aristocracy in the 1600s and cultivated a deep relationship with the Lord. As a young adult, she felt called to be a cloistered nun, you know, a nun who spends her entire life in prayer, never leaving her monastery, but interceding for the world. But she was rejected by all the religious communities that she applied to. And so, a little bit confused and lost, her family suggested that maybe she should try marriage. So she married a good and devout aristocratic man, and they had one son. And it was actually a pretty happy marriage. But she was still restless. She wanted to put that faith into action, but couldn't figure out how to do it. Now, tragically, her husband died of an illness, and so she, as a widow with a son to raise, she was kind of cast uh, away from the aristocracy, and really she became lower middle class, just kind of an ordinary woman. Now, around the same time, a priest named St. Vincent de Paul had been launching an initiative that he called the Ladies of Charity, which recruited aristocratic ladies to work with the poor. But that initiative, unfortunately, was a failure, because the rich women wear their fancy dresses into the slums and be afraid to get their hands dirty, while the poor they were serving were insulted by the condescending attitude of the rich. So it wasn't working for the rich and it wasn't working for the poor. So Father Vincent knew he needed a new tactic where ordinary women, not the 1% of the rich, would actually serve the poor. So he quickly found a friend then in Louise who had that same vision of spending her life to relieve the distress of the destitute. Together they organized a group of young women who wanted to dedicate their lives to the service of the poor and orphans. So starting with only four women, they soon grew and attracted many more young ladies who wanted to give themselves over to service for love of Jesus and souls. By the end of her life, she had opened over 40 homes where the poor, orphans, widows, and the sick could find food, shelter, and love and care. And the women she gathered to care for them became the Daughters of Charity, a religious community that still exists to this day. So she combined her deep piety with a fervor to serve it really was the best of both worlds. You know, like Jack and Jill, popcorn in a movie, let thunder and lightning, so faith and works go together. We are saved by our living faith in Jesus Christ and a vibrant relationship with him that's lived out in our thoughts, words, and deeds. 